Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Fellowship. So grateful to have you here. How you guys doing? Good. Okay. Well, we are in the book of Revelation. We're going to do chapter 8 this time. We uh, and going into chapter 9, and we're going to start looking at the first five trumpets as they are described in Revelation. So if you'll join me, Revelation chapter 8, we'll get uh, started right away. <clears throat> we're going to pick it up at verse 6. So seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blast of the trumpet, of the three angels who are about to sound. And then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Then they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days men will seek death and will not find it, and they will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, on their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months, and they had as their king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. But in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for allowing us this opportunity to study your word. Lord, as you laid this out for us and gave us this road map of how to tell the things that are coming, Lord, we are grateful that those of us who already call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But Lord, let our hearts break for those who don't know you. And as we learn today from you, Holy Spirit, because we surrender all to you, we ask you to pour into us today. We ask you to prepare us and set us up, Lord, so that we can share your good news. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as I said, good morning and welcome. Uh, this is a second service, if you will, and I'm uh, always amazed that we've been in this new facility for uh, just a few weeks, and, and it's such a blessing. It's such a beautiful place, and, and if you're watching us by online or by Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching us on the website or our app, um, please come. We'd love to have you, and I'm going to talk more about that later, but right now, we're going to talk about the, 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 the first five trumpets, uh, the vegetation, the seas, and the water will be struck. Then there will be the heavens that will be struck, and then we'll see these locusts, if you will. But before we go there, I want to talk about something. I want to talk about time in the military. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and talk to you about how I was in the military. And, and, and you know, as you know, those of you who know I did, I, I spent a career there. Um, on top of everything else I did. So God has been very good to me. But one of the things that the military is good at is drill. 
And what drill means is that you learn to step properly. You learn to everything has movements to it. There's a discipline and an order to everything that you do. And you march in a straight line and you carry your rifles a certain way. And the Marine Corps has a, a group of people called the Silent Drill Team. And the Silent Drill Team, they are, uh, I don't remember exactly how many of them there are. I served with some of them during the Gulf War and uh, even before that. <clears throat> they are precision. They're all about the same height. They all work all day long. They practice, practice, practice these manual of arms, handing the rifles back and forth and flipping the rifles and all the things that I would screw up, <laughs> screw up if I was doing it. So uh, God just chose to keep me in the infantry. But they have a counterpart in the Marine Corps. They're drill instructors. And the drill instructors are the guys that, and girls and ladies and men that meet you when you get to either Paris Island or San Diego. And I went to Paris Island. And when they meet the bus, they're in control of everything you do from the time you step off that bus until the time that you walk across that parade deck in graduation. Everything they teach you has a, move, has a meaning to it. Everything has a reason, a cause and effect. And that's on purpose. Now, if you don't have a military background, try this one. Maybe you were in the marching band. If you were in the marching band and you were able to, you know, talk about that, um, it's the same thing. You, you march, you know, on the beat, left foot, left foot, left foot, that kind of thing. So if you're doing that, you get the, the, if you've got that background in, 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 uh, in marching band or military, you understand what I'm saying about order and discipline and everything has a place and they all fit together. Why am I saying this to you? Here is why I'm saying this to you. God is a God of order. God is a God who absolutely, He is the God. He is Yahweh. He is all, everything. He is the creator of the universe. And He has everything in order. Things happen in order. So these seven trumpets are going to be sounded. I'm going to talk about the trumpets in a few minutes and tell you what they mean and all that stuff. But first, I just wanted to say to you, get in mind if you can, wrap your, wrap your mind around this analogy I just gave you so that you understand everything has a movement to it. Why do we do a left turn? Why do we step off together on the left foot, step out on your left? Why do we do that instead of stepping out on our right? Why do we make column lefts and column rights and why do we do manual at arms what's that about everything has a reason i'll give you one more example okay so when you're in a platoon if you've ever seen video of these guys in platoon you can even see it on gomer pile <laughs> if you want to watch a rerun of gomer pile or any military show when you see the the people standing in ranks okay and the person they have their weapon and they're going to be inspected and they have to show their weapon is clear to give it to the person to inspect it they'll bring it up They'll hold it, they'll, they'll clear the chamber, they'll look at the chamber, they'll put it up like this. They don't look at it this way, those are the old days. They put it up like this, they make sure it's clear, they bring it back, and then the person takes it from them. They take a look at it, they hand it back to them, they run the bolt home, they put the dust cover on it, they bring it back to it, and then they go on about their business. Now everything is done that way so that safety first, so somebody doesn't get shot, so there's not an inadvertent round in there somewhere. That got worked into that because I'm sure somebody got shot. Now, they didn't do manual at arms with a bow and arrow. <laughs> I mean, how would that look? Sorry, bad joke. Anyway, um, here's my point. These seven angels have an exact job. And remember, angels typically are named for what they do. So these angels are going to be blowing trumpets. They're announcers. Okay? That's what's going to happen here. Now, in verse 6, where we're starting at today, the seven angels have the seven trumpets have prepared themselves to sound. So in other words, they've stepped up. Now, I don't know if you've seen, you know, in Rome and other places, they have these statues with these long pipe things with these angels with wings or blowing the horns and all that kind of stuff. That's how men back then saw things. OK, I don't know how they look. All I know is that they are going to be announcing something and their horns can be long or they can be short, whatever they're going to be. They're going to be announcing. So they're preparing themselves. They've reported. They've got their instruments. And they're ready to go. This should be taken literally. Okay? Literal. We have to stop taking everything allegorically. And you're going to see inside of these, uh, these, as these trumpets are blown, you're going to see similarities between what happened with Israel when they were coming out of Egypt and these. So 
Again, God is going to work up to a point, and then when we hit the first woe, I'll let you in on what He's going to do different there. Now, trumpets, if you look in the Bible for references to what they mean, Numbers chapter 10 is a great place to look, okay? Numbers chapter 10 um, it says trumpets are used for three things. The first thing they're used for is gathering people together. Okay, so I'm going to bring the military back in now. On top of drill and marching and weapons and all this stuff, <clears throat> they have bugle calls. Certain things that the military does. For instance, in the morning when it's time to get up, they blow reveille. Dun, 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 and everybody gets up, right? And when it's in the evening time, they blow taps as they're bringing the colors down. They blow the national anthem is played after they do the adjutant's call, and they bring the they run the, the the ensign up or the United States flag up on an installation in the morning. The trumpets are used to announce something. An adjutant's call means get ready. We're going to bring everybody together. So that's what this means here. Gather together. Okay, and that's a very fast truncated. I'm sure somebody in the military is going to say, Bob, you're wrong. I'm just truncating it to give people an opportunity to hear it. Now. The second thing that they're used for is to announce war. Okay, so when Moses was getting ready to take Joshua and the army out, and, and Moses is going to be on the hill directing the, the war with her and, and uh, Aaron holding his arms up, Joshua's taking the army out. That call went out through a bugle. So not only does it bring people to a bugle, a horn, <laughs> not only does it bring people together, it signals that we're going to war. Da, 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 charge, right? That's what the cavalry did. They would blow the bugle and sound charge. You hear that in all the John Wayne movies, and if you haven't watched the John Wayne movie, go watch one. But he's got some really great ones that are about cavalry, and you should look at those because they'll give you the sense of what was done with the army back in the day when they had cavalry. They would sound charge, charge, let's go. All right? Or if you watched Braveheart when he is yelling, off we go into battle. Same mindset when you're getting ready to go to war. And then the third thing is to announce that the king has been anointed and is sitting on their throne. Okay? So now let's get them back together and talk about them for just a second. Let's break down the scripture from the Torah that I just gave you. And if I do it properly, I don't need to tell you anything else right here. This is the end right here. Today's crux right here. You ready? The Lord is gathering his people together. He's announcing war on rebellious, sinning world and the demons that are rebelling against him. And he's announcing that the king has taken his throne. It's as simple as that. So Numbers chapter 10 tells us how we are to take this. Okay, What we're to understand is that God is gathering his people together. Okay? He's bringing them together. He's going to take Israel and he's going to protect them. He's got 144,000 uh, ministers that are going to go out and witness all from the 12 tribes. Remember, we talked about that last week. And the saints that get saved in the tribulation period for the name of Christ are going to be the ones that go and witness also. It's not just going to be the Jews. And, and then we know that God's going to pro provide protection for Israel later. So he's calling his people together. Let's talk about the first trumpet. Vegetation is going to be struck, all right? And it's interesting, in verse 7, when he talks about that, he said, hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. Why? He does that in a couple of places. One place he talks about it is in Joel chapter 2, verse 30, where he says, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. When he's talking about the last days, and I'm going to talk about Ezekiel 38 in just a second, Blood is always in there. Fire, fire is purification. The hailstorms are judgment, Sodom and Gomorrah, remember? And then the blood. Blood is always required for remission of sin, or blood is poured out on those who've sinned. But we remember that in the law it says that blood is required for sins, remission. So that could be what God is doing here. Now, Ezekiel 38 verse 22 says... And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him. Flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. The War of Ezekiel 38, Gog and Magog War, as a lot of people like to call it. The kings of the north are going to come. And they're going to come against Israel. Israel's going to have her walls down and think she's at peace. 
They're going to come, and they're going to come hard and fast, and God himself, no one's going to help Israel. Hey, right now they're dealing with the internal war. All right, They're dealing with the internal stuff, Psalm 83. But we're on the road to Ezekiel 38. Make no mistake about it, we're on the road to Ezekiel 38. And so they're going to come into that country, and God himself is going to strike them so hard that five-sixths, the Scripture says, of their army will be decimated. They'll have one-sixth of their military to go back. The bodies are going to be so, multi so many of them that it's going to take seven months to bury the dead, and it's going to take seven years to burn the weapons. So when he says what kind of judgment he's going to bring here, pestilence and bloodshed, he's going to rain down on him with hail fire, hailstones, fire, and brimstone. This is judgment that's dead serious. And all of this stuff is going to strike only one-third of the vegetation on this earth. And it's not going to just strike, you know, old dead trees that, you know, like in California when things catch on fire and the, those big fires burn and burns hundreds of thousands of acres and destroys beautiful land and everything else because of this, that, or the other. One third of vegetation, and it's not going to be just dead stuff. It's going to be green grass and trees. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm not listening. I didn't do great science, okay? But I know this. We need trees to give us air. Trees need us to give them carbon dioxide. Okay? So if we have this exchange and God takes a third of them out, now all of a sudden air is a problem. Okay? And he's talking about green grass. Also, what he's saying to these, these rebellious people and these rebellious angels is that, look, I take the good stuff from you. Not the bad stuff, because I am the creator of all. That's what he's saying. So there's some speculation here that I think I can uh, 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 do away with by saying this. The whole climate change thing, just remember, God's going to use nature first. Okay? These hailstones and stuff that are going to destroy vegetation and grass and things are going to make it harder. For man's existence, and it's going to get worse from there. Now, could these, you know, could, could there be some volcanoes and things involved in that? Well, we can discuss that another time, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand that he's not just taking out just willy nilly. Ah, just going to take a third or whatever. No, he's taking the good stuff because man is depending on this earth and he's depending on the world and he's not taking his feet out of this world. So he says, okay, well, then I'll take it from you. Now, when the second trumpet sounds, the seas are going to be struck. And when I say seas, I mean the oceans. Okay? And it's going to be awful. Something like a great mountain is burning with fire. It will be thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea is going to become blood. All right, so listen, a great mountain. I kind of liken that to like a super volcano, like at Yellowstone, that's going to erupt, okay? And, and, and it's going to throw this big chunk of earth into the ocean, and it's going to be filled with toxicity and everything else, and it's just going to, because God's going to do supernatural work here, just like they did in Egypt, the water's going to turn to blood. It's not going to be red tide and all that stuff. It's going to be blood. And remember, this thing is going to be so cataclysmic that it's going to kill a third of the life in the sea and on the sea. All right? So that means ships won't be able to do their job. People won't be able to fish. And it's going to kill sea life, which people need to exist because a lot of people eat fish. Not only that, there's going to be these ripples that come off of this thing that are going to smash shorelines and everything else with blood. One third of the entire sea and the dead sea life will intensify that. That's what's going to happen. So let's don't make this symbolic. This is something people have a tendency to do when they read Revelation. They tend to try to spiritualize or symbolic or allegorically do things. Listen, there are places where things can't be explained that we have to do this, okay? But the reality is, this is literal. Like I said at the beginning, this should be taken literally. Take Revelation literally, because you're almost always going to be able to find Scripture that backs it up or clarifies it for you. When this event happens, it's probably going to cause a tsunami. 
And even if the blood doesn't wash up somewhere else, when you, when you jolt the earth like that, other things happen. Other things happen. And so we don't know what else is going to follow, but we do know that the next trumpet that comes after this one is going to be, uh, well, let me just get there. But I want to say something first. The majority of the surface of this earth is, is water. Okay, the oceans, the seas cover most of the earth. And I'm going to touch on something in a second when I talk about the next trumpet that's going to tie into here. But I want you to remember this. If you took all the continents and you did Pangea, okay, Pangea, where you put the continents together. If you were to do that and put them together, you know, it's kind of cool. If you've got that kind of time, or go, go Google it. Just, you know, I'm sorry to give Google a plug, but go Google it and look it up and look at the pictures, look at the maps of how these things work together and see what they look like. They all kind of fit together, but then you notice the rest of the globe is water. One third of that, <clears throat> one third of that will be blood. What, does the, what, does, what, what happens when the earth rotates? We have tides, right? I'll get to those in a second. All of the effects of that, all of the ecosystem will be affected, first by the trees, now by the sea, and then the third trumpet where the waters are struck. Which waters, Bob? Fresh water. Fresh water. I don't know how many times I've heard over and over. I've been there myself in the desert when it's, we've, we outran our supply chains, our trains. Um, the human body cannot live without water. So let's see what God's going to do here in verses 10 through 11. Then the third angel said, And a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. Okay? Let's take that apart for just a second. And first, let me tell you something. It's coming. So it's going to be a meteor or a comet or something of that nature. All right, now there's people who try to spiritualize this and say, this is an angel that falls and strikes them. I don't think so. I think God is going to allow something to come from heaven that's going to disrupt water. Now, it is curious. I mean, this is a rabbit trail, but just humor me. You know, um, when the Garden of Eden was here, the headwaters came from there. The four rivers came from there. So, you know, God is infinite and God is all-knowing all and all er, er, omnipotent, omniscient, everything. And he, maybe he's got a spot that he's going to hit a specific spot that will affect all of the fresh water on this earth. Only God knows how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. And this is critical. It's going to be called wormwood. And wormwood is an actual bitter plant that grows in the desert. It's mentioned in the Old Testament seven times. It's... Well-known, Wormwood. And people always read that and go, well, that must be the angel's name. Let's, let's look at a couple of things here about Wormwood, okay? It says that the star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. So we know it's not the plant. This is something that's going to affect, but it's going to have a Wormwood effect on people. Actually, let me, let me just keep going and I'll, I'll explain it to you. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 4 says, but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Bitter as wormwood. She is bitter as wormwood. Bitter. Bitter. Lamentations 3.15 says, He has filled me with bitterness. He's made me to drink wormwood. The rest of the verse, chapter 11, says, A third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made Bitter. All right, so here's where I was going a second ago. You can live without food for a while. You cannot live without water for long. Remember a minute ago when I was talking about the ocean, if you put all the, the, the continents together and everything together, how it makes this kind of you know blob, and then the rest is water? That's the human body. Our bodies are composed of mostly water. And then we have the earth composition inside of us. And the two of them balance perfectly to make this. God made us from the dirt of the earth. 
they've already proven that a thousand times over. So <laughs> give me this two, two rocks cracking in the space stuff and I'll just dismiss it because the scripture says that God made Adam from the dust of the land or the dirt of the land. And when they've done the composition of our bodies, they have found that we are those elements. So think of it this way. Your body cannot exist without water. You have to have water. And if you can't get water, you're going to be willing to do almost anything for water. You're going to be willing to hurt somebody. Give up your liberty. Whatever it takes to get a drink of water. I've been out there. I've been there. I've been where we're so thirsty. We're like, man, we, we just got to keep going. And there's water in a ditch somewhere. And you're like, I can purification tablets and just drop it in there and drink it. One third of the water on this earth is not going to be drinkable. One third. And so far, these have fallen on things that affect man. But it's also saying something else in Scripture that I think really, really, really needs to be visited. But first, let me say this from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. All right, so let's take it backwards. Water of gall, bitter water. He's going to give them bitter water. He's going to give them water that they cannot drink. The verses in chapter uh, 8, verse 11 of Revelation here says, A third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water. They can't drink this gall water, but they're going to be so parched that they will, and, and, and it'll kill them. They'll die because they'll die from dehydration. They can't drink it, so they'll die, or either it's going to be so toxic it'll kill you. But here's the other thing that we miss a lot of times, and Scripture is very clear about this. Bitterness. We will see people become bitter. As a matter of fact, look around today. You're seeing people becoming more and more bitter. Bitter. Angry. Hateful. They don't need to not have a drink of water. They're just bitter. Well, this bitterness is rooted in them. Because they're going to say, They've been following Satan and his evil ways. So they're going to look and they're going to go, well, loving God, look at what loving God, he's, he's, he's cut the water off and he's killing us. Who wants to follow him? Looking to blame somebody else. The bitterness of pride, the bitterness of rebellion are in them. So he gives them over to it. But I'm going to submit to you that today, right now in our society, we're seeing bitterness just as bad. Just not in as many people yet because things are still not anywhere close to this. But it's getting there. Listen to this in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 18, as Moses was given it. So that there may not be among you, man or woman, or family or tribe, whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of the nations, and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. Friends, Churches today are struggling. They're struggling because people went, when, when the whole pandemic thing happened, a lot of people saw they're out because they weren't being fed. People are hungry. People are curious. People are saying, well, you know, I've, I've had people make fun of me. They're like, why well, are you teaching Revelation? Well, I'm teaching Revelation because it's in the Bible and because we're called upon to be discerners of the times in which we live. And inside the churches, there's a group, a couple of groups of people that are uh, the, 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 the both ends of the spectrum, if you will. They're hungry, cultural Christians who've sat in churches for 50 years and, and they know about it, but they don't know it. And then the young people who won't take our word for it because look at what our society has turned into. And they say, no, I want to study it myself. They're looking for shepherds who will lead them in the word, not lord it over them. You understand? Bitterness foments from that. When you hold the Word of God back, instead of giving it out, bitterness sets in, and we're seeing that inside the church. So God is saying, I want to shake my body, sift it and find those who are willing to pour into others. I'm finding my bodies. He stood this church up right here, and we're saying to you, come. 
come. Wormwood can be substituted, if you will, for bitterness of heart or spirit. And it's not symbolic of the false prophet or false religious leaders or an angel. It's literal. Take it literally. Now the next trumpet, the fourth trumpet, the heavens are struck. I'm going to read verse 12. For the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Now, if you take everything in order and you look at it, first God hits the vegetation, which creates a problem because we need air. Then He strikes the oceans. Oceans are part of our ecosystem in the world. They take rain up, that water goes up into the clouds. And down it comes as rain. That stops blood in the oceans and it kills the sea life. Ends the shipping. All this stuff stops. Then he goes after the fresh water so that men are parched and, and, and bitter and men die. And then, and then he strikes the heavens. Now all of a sudden, it's not just here. Now he's putting it up over them and saying, look. Because if you think about it this way, there's a couple of things that happen. If this darkness were to set in. First, though, I do want to remind you to stay away from allegory. All right. These are some of the things that have been thrown out there. The removal of the light of truth. OK, that kind of makes sense. But here's one. Islam is imposing spiritual darkness. Look, this last one really is one that I hear a lot. And think about it. Western empires collapsing. You can see that right now. Our empire, if you will, is collapsing under the weight of our rebellion. And God is allowing it. So that makes sense. But that's not what this is talking about. People need to stop trying to make things fit into Scripture. If you study the Scripture, it will tell you what's happening, not us telling it. Here's some of the possible effects of this judgment. We lose the sun's heat, which causes these dra drastic temperature fluctuations, middle of the day, whenever, middle of the night. And it's on top of that, it will cause these violent Weather changes, storms, unpredictable. You think we've seen hurricanes? Now wait till this happens. And, 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 and. Remember this. The moon affects the tides. So if you strike that and there's no, the moon's gravitational pull is interrupted, we're going to have chaos in the oceans. What's left of them? It's going to be crazy town. And you see, people just ignore this. They go, ah, worry about Bob. I don't want to study this. Bob, I'm not interested in talking about this stuff. It just doesn't interest me. You know what? It better interests you. Because if your relationship with Christ is not right, this is what you got to look forward to. Our hearts should break for those we know that aren't saved. Our hearts should break for those we know that don't have Christ in their life because this is what they have to look forward to. And you and I both know. You and I both know what's coming. You and I both know we're so close to it right now you can almost touch it. The last milliseconds. The age of grace. They're already trying to set up explaining once the body of Christ is gone. They're trying to explain that already. They're going to blame us forever. They're going to blame us for all of this. And they're going to go after the Christians and Jews on this earth. See, I don't have to, I don't have to do anything to just teach the Scripture. You don't need to know my opinion. This is what God is saying is going to happen. Now, have we seen this before? Yes. The sun was darkened when God was taking them out of Egypt, remember? Moses brought those ten plagues. It also went dark when Jesus died on the cross. 
When he said it is finished, what does the scripture say? This guy turned black and roiled, roiled. Chaos, anger, because the wrath of the world, the sin of all was poured out on the Lamb of God. And God's wrath showed in the heavens. This is His judgment. Now verse 13 says that He looked, and I looked, John says, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Whoa! Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet and the three angels who are about to sound. I want to read a quote to you first from Rob Phillips before I get into what I want to tell you about this. The eagle is a symbol of the Romans and is found on their ensigns or their flags or their banners. For some to support a first century fulfillment of Revelation as Romans swoop down upon Jerusalem like an eagle on its prey and bring the nation to ruin in 70 A.D. Okay, what is he saying? This is the preterist mindset. I'll talk about that again in a minute for a little refresher. But this is the mindset that everything happened already. And in there is the word eagle. Why am I bringing that up and what does this quote have to do? Here we go. So the King James and the New King James translation, the New King James says, angel. Not eagle. Some of you probably have a, a different version that says eagle. Okay? To, eagle, to, to many, eagles represent judgment. A lot of the Old Testament prophets and things like that would talk about eagles meaning judgment. But the word agilos, which is in the King James, translates to a messenger. So it should read like this. And I looked and I heard a messenger flying in the midst of heaven. Okay? But some of you have this one that says, and an eagle cries with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth. So there's two words in the Greek language to describe dwellers on the earth. So you've got this eagle or this messenger, and I'm going to stick with messenger because angels have names and this angel's name is messenger and he's delivering this message from on high. Okay? It could be an eagle. I could be wrong. And... You know, now that we understand drone technology and things like that, it could be an eagle. Well, you know, we could, it could be, but I, I don't know. God doesn't need that. Okay, God sends his messenger. All of this is happening while these trumpets are being blown. One, parochio, which means to dwell as a sojourner. When you walk with Christ, when you are saved, you're a sojourner. Here. You're just traveling through this world to be with Him. You're just here. You're not, you're on sojourn. You're not here permanently. The other word is katokio, which means to settle down. And I know I said them both incorrectly. I apologize to anyone who speaks Greek. Katokio or something like that means to settle down. They've put their roots down. They've said, this world is what I want and I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to do it. And I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this. That's, there's no God. That's what they say. I'm just going to stay here. Well, He's going to leave them here. And He's going to judge them. So if we look closely at that last word, katokio, we can interpret that eagle does represent judgment on a world that's firmly chosen their God, the world and all that comes with it. They've chosen it above and beyond and over Yahweh, our Father God, Abba, Father, our Creator. And because they've done this, there's no turning back. Their desires are here. Our desires are supposed to be up there, laying up treasures in heaven. So the eagle tells them three times, or the messenger tells them three times, Whoa! Because they're going to clearly get exactly what they want. They're going to get their stake in this world. The world is passing away. So, I want to do a real quick, just touch on 
what I said a second ago about preterists and what people believe, because I think it's critical here. The preterist sees the events of Revelation as already fulfilled, okay, in the first century of the church age. They assign the events of this fourth trumpet to the Jewish War of 66 to 70 AD in Jerusalem when Titus sacked Jerusalem. And then Rome renamed it Palestine a number of years later. Rome, not God. It's Israel. Historist, historicists view the events of Revelation as unfolding throughout the course of history. And they view the sun, moon, and stars as the political firmament of the Roman government. Okay? And they'll argue that the events described in the fourth trumpet judgment were fulfilled when the Roman government collapsed or the Roman Empire collapsed in 467 AD. All right? Then you have the futurists, which are us, and in our group split into two. Revelations largely unfulfilled, especially chapters 4 to 22, and are divided amongst these two groups, the literalists, and the symbolic believers. There are many, many people standing in my position right now that will tell you that I'm wrong, that it's all symbolic. They got all these college degrees and all this education and all these big positions and churches with big salaries and all this kind of stuff, and they'll stand up here and they'll tell you it's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. No, it's literal. Judgment is not symbolic. Judgment is is literal. This is in writing for a reason. If we were going to tell folk tales about what's going to happen, remember the old game we used to play in a circle? You whisper in somebody's ear and by the time it gets back around to you, you said the cat's in the front yard and by the time it gets back around to you, it's six flags closes at nine o'clock tonight. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> right? That's what folklore would do for you. God wrote it down for us. And He told us, this is what's going to happen. So we need to stop spiritualizing things. As a matter of fact, they'll cite this verse. Listen, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe what is false, so that all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth but enjoyed unrighteousness. They'll try to say... That those who don't understand the symbiology are misled. Strong delusion has set in on them. And then those who believe like I do, it's literal, say the same thing about them. You know what? This is literal. They'll find out. As long as your relationship with Jesus Christ is solid and your feet are on solid ground with Him and He is your Lord and Savior, we can argue about whatever we want to argue about. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's not a doctrine changer. And then you have the idealists or the spiritualists who see Revelation sending forth timeless truths concerning the battle between good and evil. Okay? Those are the four that we've studied already. I just wanted to take a quick second there and touch on those before I go to the next one because there are four things that have happened here. The vegetation has been touched, a third of it's gone. The oceans and sea has been touched, a third of it is blood and dead. The, a third of, of the water of wormwood has affected the fresh water supply of the world. And then a third of the heavens, the sun and the moon have darkened. All of these things have happened, but there's been one thing, with the exception of wormwood, a little bit, that hasn't happened yet. God hasn't directly put his hand on man. But here it comes. Fifth trumpet. The locusts are going to come out of the bottomless pit. Now I'm going to prove something to you that is taught in many places. I'm about to take the steam out of it. These do not happen six days in a row, seven days in a row. They can't. How do I know that? Because what's fixing to happen? The first four have happened over a period of three and a half years. How do I know? Because God told me in Scripture. And He's also, this first woe, this next trumpet, has a timeline on it. And I want you to remember, there's never been in history an event like this one. 
Never. Never been one like this. So make no mistake. What is getting ready to happen here is an invasion. And the locusts are going to move like an army in precision, in lockstep, and following orders, and everything is done for a reason. The military analogy applies here. They're given strict orders. Listen to this, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because the smoke of the pit. Okay, Bob, does that mean that this is going to block the sun and all this kind of stuff? Maybe. I'll leave that to you to come to the decision on because that's not what I want to focus on. I want to take all speculation out right now. I want to remove anything from different versions of the Bible that conflict and these study Bibles and all this kind of stuff. And I want to get to something which we saw just a few minutes ago. This is clearly Satan. How do I know? And I saw a star fallen from the heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. This is his fall, recorded right here. Not the mountain that fell in the ocean. Not the star that hit the fresh water. This one's different, because he has the key to the bottomless pit. And I'm going to talk about that bottomless pit in just a second, but let me finish with this. This also is the beginning of the Great Tribulation period. This is the midway point in the seven years when he actually is cast to earth. And he is cast to earth and he can only do what God allows him to do. Even in the midst of getting to do his rebellion, he only can do what God allows him to do. And God says, take this key and go let your friends out. I'll get to them in a minute. Satan is this guy. And this is when Antichrist will be wounded. And I believe that Satan will come and indwell his body and raise him up from the dead. And they'll all fall at his feet because they'll say, Oh my, my God, my God. And it's going to be worse. Because now these are affecting men directly. First woe. This place, this bottomless pit that he's going to, this is the place he's going to live for a thousand years. He's going to be bound for a thousand years. The millennial reign. And in the millennial reign, he's going to have no sway. But sin's still going to be here because our hearts are wicked. So the human who lives here is going to have an opportunity still by God's grace. That interesting. This is the holding place for demons. Make no mistake what this is. This is the abyss. This is the place. This is the darkest separation. This is not just torment. This is the darkest separation. This is a place where that deep smoke is the constant reminder to them of the agony that awaits them for rebelling in heavenly places. And he's given the key to it. Now, how do I know he didn't have the key? Because in chapter 1 of Revelation, in verse 18, Jesus says, I have the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The only way he could have got that key is from Jesus, the Lamb himself. He's being allowed to do this. And he comes down here to do it. Now, don't confuse this abyss with Tartarus. Okay, so the reason I'm picking on the word Tartarus is because it's used in the New Testament. And I'm going to give you the Greek and the Roman philosophical explanation for what Tartarus is, or hell. This is different. Listen to this. Tartarus is a deep abyss in their mind. The core of the earth, if you will. The liquid hot magma, the burning place. In Greek mythology, Tartarus is the deep abyss that's used as a dungeon of torment and suffering for the wicked and as a prison for the titans or the demons. 
where souls are judged after death and where the wicked receive divine punishment. That's a pretty good explanation for it, don't you think? Greek's pretty smart. Listen to the Romans. They just, <laughs> the Romans kind of eh, shrink it. Sinners, as defined by Roman societal and cultural norms of their time, are sent to Tartarus for punishment after death. Both say the same thing. So yes, they understood it. The difference between this place and that place is where we go, meaning human beings, to be held until the great white throne judgment, separated from God and in torment. These guys are in a place of eternal separation from God and they're going to be used by God for His glory to do what He's going to do, His work here. And He's going to use them. And He makes them be in a separation place. Now, this isn't a place that they love. Not even close. Verse 3 says, Out of the smoke came these locusts. And they had powers as scorpions have. What do scorpions do? Sting you. And when they sting you, it hurts. Now, someone shared with me the, the last service, they'd been bitten by a black widow. I can't even imagine. I was bitten by a brown recluse. Thankfully, they caught it in time. Spiders are dangerous. Think about a, think about a scorpion. I knew people that I served in the desert with that put their foot in their boot, and the scorpion was in their boot, and it hit them in the arch of their foot, the arch of your foot. You got a scorpion sting. You can't put any weight on your foot. You can't do anything. It's debilitating. One little bitty creature. And you know, it's funny. <laughs> we always have this saying about, you know, why do you not leave Marine Lance corporals unattended? Because they will find something to do. And it typically ain't good. So you can't Lance Corporal proof a, a, a scorpion. And there's always somebody who wants to pick one up and inevitably they get hit. These scorpions have some supernatural power. They're not playing around. In my estimation, actually, these are some of the worst demons. Period. These were warriors. We're going to talk about that in just a second. These were the warriors Satan has been saving. He's waiting. They're loyal to him. They'll do whatever he commands them to do, but they're not going to do anything that he doesn't command them to do because he's not going to do anything that he's not commanded to do. And Jesus cast out the demons in the man called Legion. If you recall that in the book of Luke, we studied that. And when he asked Legion, who are you? And he said, I'm Legion for we are many. And he says, come out of him. And they begged him, please do not send us to the abyss. Please do not send us to this place. Send us into those pigs over there. And he does. He says, go. And they go. And they kill the pigs and they mess up the ecosystem for the, or the economy for these people. And they come and say, Jesus, you got to get back on the boat, bro. you got to go. You're messing up our money. The Son of God just cast out a thousand demons. Two thousand demons. They watched everything that happened and all they can care about is that I just lost all my bacon and pork chops. They chose an unclean animal to go to. Why? Because they're unclean. If they were clean, they'd be in their high heavenly abode with God. See what I'm saying? So we know this is a place of torment. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, they begged him that he would not command them to go into, go out into the abyss. Key word, go out into the abyss. Let's see. I heard something like that before. That's right. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was void and formless. And God said, let there be light. Where do you think this was? I, I, as I've taught many times, the word void there means to dis, the, 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 the water used to wash feet when you throw it out or void your bladder. It's that. It's thrown out. It's disgusting. It's something you don't want near you. That's where God cast them. This is where they are. Utter darkness and separation, smoke and torment, and hasn't even begun yet because guess what? They got the lake of fire waiting for them. So they get a chance to get out. They're going to do exactly what they're told because they want out. Verse 
Verses 4 and 5 say they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. They were not given authority to kill them, but only to torment them for five months. These, these demons aren't even designed to kill or damage the vegetation. A typical locust... When I lived in Nevada, if I remember this correctly, um, we had Mormon locusts. I think that's what they were called. But there would be swarms of them. They would just show up out of nowhere. They'd be all over a house or a yard, and, and you'd run over them, and they'd be crunching all under your tires. This is nothing like that. These critters are not interested in eating the trees and stuff. God's already taken care of that. Oh, no. These things, these demons, John is giving us the best description he can. And a scorpion is the best thing he can think of because of what they do. But I want you to listen to their makeup. Well, actually, let me, let me back up off. Let me, let me get to their makeup in a second. There's a couple things I, wanted, I, wanted to do, I wanted to talk about here. They're not allowed to touch those who are marked. That doesn't just mean the 144,000. That means anyone who's accepted the name of Christ and has not been martyred yet. How are they going to be marked? I don't know. It says they have, their name of, says they have uh, the name of God on their foreheads. So there will be a mark on a person who's saved in the tribulation period that marks them as God's. And they can't touch them. And, and obviously they can see it and they know what it means. So again, pretty wise, pretty smart demons. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So, in that time, and, as a matter of fact, right now, turn away from your sin. If you've called on the name of Jesus, you cannot have a foot in each camp. You have to decide to walk away from your sin. So do that, is what he's saying. Jesus is calling you, calling me. He's calling those who are lost to come. He's calling us to attention, to pay attention to those, to give the good news of man to, to man that Jesus Christ is King. Verse 6 says they're going to seek death and they're not going to be allowed to die. Death will flee from them. They will not even be able to commit suicide. Can you believe that? This is going to be anguish. Again, if you've ever been stung by a scorpion, it subsides. Now, being bit by one of the spiders, that lasts longer, it can kill you. But they're going to be stung by this thing and they're not going to be allowed to die. They're going to be suffering for five months. That also, back up for a second, works into what I said about timeline. See, this is a five-month period for these stings. Now, does it mean that they're only going to sting them at the very beginning and it's only going to last for five months, or does it mean that they're going to continue to sting people as they come out of it and they'll do five more months? We don't know. It doesn't say that it ends. Think about that. Three and a half years? 42 months. How many times will five go into 42? Eight, which is 40, with two months left over, carry the one. That's six, six, six. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's a long time. Now let's look at these. They're shaped like a horse prepared for battle, and on their heads are crowns, something like gold, and their faces are like the faces of men, and their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like the teeth of a lion. Horses prepared for battle. These things are on go. That's what that means. They're ready to go. They're not coming out here going, ah, la, la. But here's where some people spiritualize this to say they reflect Satan's supernatural power. Because he does have some supernatural power. that He was given. Their appearance or the description of their appearance is a reflection of that. Why? Well... Satan doesn't come to you with a pointy tail and a pitchfork and horns on his head. 
He comes to you as something beautiful, a movie star, a singer, a person you met at so-and-so. They come to you as an angel of light because you're not going to be drawn to something ugly and evil. Like Hollywood does all these gory things with these zombies and things like that. And, and people aren't drawn to that. Well, I mean, they are drawn to it because it's kind of, you know, they're like, oh, it's like watching a car wreck. People have car wrecks watching car wrecks, looking at them. Think I'm kidding? Go on the freeway. But, and I'm, and I'm going to say this plainly, they may be drawn to it, but they don't want to be it. They're going to want to be this. They're going to see these men's faces, these good-looking warrior types with long, flowing hair, and it's going to be like, oh, i got to see that, because it can't sting you unless you touch it or try to touch it. Scorpions aren't aggressive. They don't chase you across the wall. I mean, they might. Okay, let me... I guess there's some way to prove everything, and I've, I've seen people, you know, do stupid stuff, so... Okay, maybe a scorpion will chase you. Typically, they don't. They try to get away from you. You're a little bigger than they are, and typically, I made them the bottom of my boot. Smashed them as hard as I could. But these guys are going to have teeth like lions. They're not going to reveal those teeth until you've gotten close enough that they can bite you. And that's what that means. They will rip people to shreds. And their wings like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. In other words, you're going to hear this roar as they're coming. And people are going to stand there and go, what is that, Edna? And it's going to hit them. They're going to go, oh, look at those. Whack, five months. Now this sounds cartoonish in a way, doesn't it? Kind of comic bookish. But let me go ahead and tell you it's not. John's describing it, as I told you before, the best way he knows how. They had a king over them, too. He's the angel of the bottomless pit. This is their leader. This is one of the lieutenants that reports to Satan. Hebrew, his name is Abaddon, and in Greek, his name is Apollyon. You know what his name means when translated out of either language? Destroyer. This angel's name is Destroyer. Now, remember I told you that these will reflect the plagues of Egypt in some forms. The angel of death that came was the destroyer. There are those who've said that that's the same translation. I didn't get it that way, but there are those who say that. Regardless, he is the destroyer, and he's been shackled. Why? Because he's a bad boy, and he is not to be trusted. But they're going to. They're going to look at these and they're going to say, oh, how pretty. God would never do that. But you see, this is just one woe that's passed, it says. Two more woes are coming after these things. It's going to get so bad. We all have family and friends. We all know somebody who doesn't know Jesus. We all have that opportunity to share the gospel, and maybe we don't. On our website, there are three words right at the top that says, Jesus is calling. Because He is calling. You know what He's saying? Come. Come to me. All you who are hungry, all you who are thirsty, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. Come. Those of you who need shelter, I am your rock and your salvation. I am the chief cornerstone. Come. Do you know that inside of the body of Christ, there are people so hungry and starving for teaching of the Word of God? yet they are too proud to admit it? Do you know that there are people outside the church who are hungry for the Word of God, but are too proud to admit it? What's the difference? 
Jesus is telling them, come. Come to me. Time is short. These things are getting ready to happen. Discern the times in which you live. Know the time in which you live. We have a mandate. Calvary Fellowship was not stood up for no reason. We serve the risen King who's saying, come. We have to be prepared to receive the rain that we've been praying for. And we are. Look what He gave us. God is good all the time. But He's also just. And the wicked will not escape His judgment. Even though they think they will. And those who believe the lie, those who think that this angel of light has the answer, need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. For He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Tell them the truth. Because no one comes to the Father except through Him. Please, I'm asking you, if the opportunity avails itself to you this week, share the gospel. Tell them that Jesus is calling. And invite them to come. And if you're listening to me or watching me and you have a church home already, but you haven't been going or whatever, get back in there. If you're not getting fed, find a place where you can be fed. Every one of us is responsible for feeding others. Jesus said, you are my hands and my feet. Go into all the world. That's what we're supposed to do. He's calling all men to Him. It's not just, you know, I had a, I had a pastor, I'm going to close with this. I had a pastor um, say to me one time, uh, not to me, he said it in a sermon, that the, the, church, the church should be like a hospital for the sick, broken, and wounded. I'm going to come back to what I started with in the beginning. I'm a military guy. When we went to battle, we had corpsmen with us, or the army had medics with them. The aid came to them to stabilize them enough to get them back to a place where they could heal. You see, our job is to go to them. And if you're hearing my voice or you're watching me and you're not here, come. We're to take the gospel to them and we're to share it with them. And we're to give them the good news. But then most churches, when people do and they accept Christ, they don't disciple. We have to be intentional about that. Disciple in others. Because when you tell them the good news and then you don't continue to feed them until they grow, they sit there on milk. And then deception comes because Satan comes in. And then you start talking about the soil and the, the seeds planted in the different kinds of places. Sprouts up in one day and its sun burns it up. Friend, there's no more time for that. Jesus is calling you. Come. Come to me. That's the message we need to take out here today. That these things are coming. 